On the 24th of February 1991, coalition forces launched a massive ground assault against Iraqi army units occupying Kuwait. In less than 100 hours, a substantial portion of the fourth largest army in the world was destroyed and Kuwait liberated. Waged for the most part in trackless desert, the Gulf War was dominated by high-tech weapons in the hands of a well-trained military. This program examines the weapons used during the campaign and the objectives of the war which determined how these weapons were used. It also chronicles the final battles that brought Desert Storm to its victorious conclusion. In November 1990, President George Bush increased the scale of U.S. forces stationed in Saudi Arabia. What had been a force suitable for defending Saudi Arabia from any further Iraqi aggression became a force designed to destroy the Iraqi army in the Kuwait theater. It would take over two months to move these forces from bases in Europe and the United States to the Gulf. Meanwhile, America's Gulf allies, including Britain, also began deploying and reinforcing their own forces in the region. The initial ground units sent to the Gulf to deter further Iraqi aggression were centered on two main elements, the Army's 18th Airborne Corps and Marine Corps' Expeditionary Forces. The 18th Airborne Corps was configured to be light and easy to move, sacrificing firepower for transportability. It was based around three divisions, the 82nd Airborne, a paratrooper division, the 101st Air Assault, a helicopter-borne infantry division, and the 24th Mechanized, a heavy infantry division with a substantial armor force. United States Marine Corps divisions were also configured on the basis of strategic mobility. Even with the Allied coalition forces added, these initial American formations were believed to be insufficient to liberate Kuwait. President Bush's November decision led to the deployment of the Army's heavy maneuver forces to Saudi Arabia. The primary U.S. Army formation was the 7th Corps, normally based in Germany. The 7th Corps would bring with it three armored divisions, a mechanized infantry division and substantial corps formations. These divisions were all heavy maneuver units, difficult to transport, but possessing substantially more combat power and tactical mobility than the forces already in the Gulf region. A unique difference between the American maneuver divisions and their Iraqi opponents was the helicopter. U.S. Army maneuver divisions were equipped with their own helicopter forces, including a substantial force of attack helicopters. Iraqi Army forces had no significant helicopter force. The principal British Army unit in the Gulf, the 1st Armored Division, was a heavy armor formation much like its American counterpart. The French Darguet force was also a mechanized formation, but smaller and more modestly equipped than either the U.S. or British Army divisions. The Arab forces of the coalition also contributed substantial armor support. Besides Saudi tank brigades, Egypt dispatched a mechanized and tank division, and Syria contributed a tank division. There were armored forces as well from Qatar and Kuwait. Since World War II, the dominant land weapon in desert warfare has been the tank. This was especially the case in the Gulf War. The majority of Iraqi tanks were the older Chinese Type 59 or the similar Soviet T-55. The best Iraqi tanks, the T-72s, were used by the Republican Guard. U.S. Army tank formations, although outnumbered, were much better equipped than their Iraqi counterparts. In the early 1980s, the U.S. Army had completely revamped its armored force by replacing the M60 series main battle tank with the new M1 Abrams. There is no tank on the battlefield anywhere in the world, certainly not on this battlefield, that even comes close to matching the M1A1 heavy armor. I mean, and that's not a hope, that's just a, an analysis of capabilities of equipment. 
The M1A1 Abrams had advantages in nearly every category over its best Iraqi opponent, the T-72. It was more thickly armored. During tank-to-tank -tank engagements, hundreds of Iraqi tanks were destroyed, while the M1A1 proved virtually indestructible. Very few M1A1 tanks were hit, and there were no fatalities as a result. The Abrams 120mm gun, combined with a more advanced fire control system, allowed it to engage and destroy Iraqi tanks at long ranges before the Iraqi tanks were effective. The British counterpart to the M1A1 Abrams was the Challenger tank, which had many of the same advantages over Iraqi tanks as its American cousin. However, not all coalition tanks were state-of-the-art. Most U.S. Marine Corps tank battalions, as well as the Saudi and Egyptian armies, used the older American M60A1 tank of the early 1970s vintage, while the French used the AMX-30B2, a modernized version of a tank first deployed in 1960. The Syrians used the Soviet-built T-62 tank, much the same type of tank used by the Iraqis. One of the most significant advantages enjoyed by Allied vehicles over their Iraqi counterparts was their use of more sophisticated night vision systems. This played a significant role during the ground campaign. Allied tanks could fight at night or in poor weather conditions when the Iraqi tanks were virtually blind. Obviously, we'd rather conduct defensive operations at night, taking advantage of our night vision devices, taking advantage of our ability to move undetected and uh, get in behind enemy lines and disrupt their ability to conduct uh, the defense. So we'd rather use the night to our advantage. Probably the greatest Allied advantage in tanks was not in the tanks themselves, but in the quality of their crews. The Gulf War demonstrated that tank fighting demanded more than simply good equipment. The training and skill of the crews proved critical to the performance of tanks in combat. The companion to the tank on the modern battlefield is the infantry fighting vehicle. Current infantry vehicles, such as the U.S. Army's Bradley, are much better armed than infantry transporters of the past, usually carrying an automatic cannon and an anti-tank missile. In contemporary tank warfare, the infantry rides into battle within the armored hull of a fighting vehicle. The infantry can dismount near the battle line to carry out its traditional combat missions. The armored infantry transporter allows the infantry to keep up with the tanks and gives the infantry protection against enemy small arms fire and artillery air bursts. Infantry mobility was a primary requirement in the Gulf War. The distances covered were vast, and the infantry needed a vehicle capable of moving them at the same pace as the tanks and the other vehicles. tanks set the tempo for modern land warfare, the artillery has been the killing arm on the battlefield since the First World War. One of the only branches of the Iraqi army to cause much concern was the artillery force. Iraqi artillery was a special focus of air attack and counter-battery fire from Allied artillery. To deal with this threat, the Allied forces had a wide variety of weapons. self-propelled 155mm howitzer was the primary weapon of coalition artillery units. Although it could be outranged by many Iraqi guns, superior fire direction and intelligence more than compensated. Artillery is no longer a contest of gun barrels alone. Targets must be accurately located and identified. The US Army and Marine Corps had several innovations to help in this respect. 
r p v s remotely